So hello, everybody. My name is Adam Smith. I'm COO of uh, Automated Insights. And I'm very excited to be here today. Our actual founder um, and executive chairman, Robbie Allen, has written about 10 books for O'Reilly. So we're big fans of Strata and O'Reilly. Excited to be here. Always uh, really honored to be part of the conference because um, they're always great events. So I'm here to talk a little bit about natural language generation, what it is, where it is, how it's being done today, different approaches to it, and then where it's going over the next decade and where we expect it to be. So let's see. Before I did that, though, I thought I'd take a step back and talk about the broader artificial intelligence um, world. Uh, as you can see in most of the panels that I've sat in today and some of the sessions this morning, as well as in the tech media, AI is going through a renaissance of sorts. Um, it's all you can hear about from self-driving cars to uh, facial recognition to translation to even what we do, which is often called robot writing. Um, it's really taken off. And, and why is that? I mean, you know, on one side, it's, it's the affordable hardware on the GPU side. It's really good open source deep learning software like TensorFlow. It's great data in the cloud owned by companies like Google, Facebook, and Baidu. And at the same time, there's a lot of big milestones that are driving interest that are happening on a regular basis. Um, you know, the session before this talked a little bit about uh, a poker algorithm beating the number one poker players across the world. Um, as many of you know, with Go, uh, which was one of the most complex games, it has almost infinite permutations as possible moves and outcomes. Uh, AlphaGo, which is a Google project, actually beat the number one uh, Go player um, I think about two days ago. So with computing power getting really strong, storage getting really cheap, we can train computers um, to understand highly complex rule sets. And that's going to be important for NLG as I talk a little bit about how it's created now um, and how we think it's going to be created in the future. So going a little bit more on the AI front, you know, it's been pretty amazing the advances that have come in training computers to recognize images. But there's also a downside to that. Even with the best image recognition algorithms, their, their errors. In, in 2015, I'm sure those of you who, uh, who know this space well know uh, Google ran into a lot of harsh press when, when its algorithm tagged people of color in, in a very insensitive light. Um, and so we've come a long way there. Um, but with, as with any AI technology, you know, especially in, in image recognition, we're far from, from matching even very young humans. Um, and last year, Microsoft released Tay, which was an AI-powered chatbot on Twitter. Um, and we're going to a lot about, about rule sets that you're actually training your algorithms on, that you're training things that are producing content on. And in Tay's, uh, in Tay's respect, it was trained on Twitter data. And so it could, unfortunately, it quickly became a racist, uh, Hitler-loving misogynist, and it had to be taken down. Um, so I think the lesson there is that AI is only good as the training data you can give it, which is still limited in many ways, especially as you get into spe specific domains and you try to talk about them intelligently, like we do with NLG. So what is NLG? Uh, there's a definition up there, but essentially it's a subset of the larger artificial intelligence space. And the idea is it's the process of taking structured data and communicating intelligently about that data just like a human would. So writing content with the context of what you're writing about, writing in a variable way over time, and communicating personally with somebody just like how a human would write it, um, but done through software. And much like the broader AI space, it's undergoing a renaissance of its own, um, but kind of in a different way. And um, I'm going to dig into that now. But first, um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about what NLG is not. So if you look up NLG or natural language generation, you dive in, most of the time it's considered a subset of natural language processing. And it's definitely related. But they are different in, in, in important ways. With NLP, practically speaking, I know a lot of you probably know more about NLP than I, but you are essentially structuring the unstructured. You're taking large volumes of unstructured data, 
novels, articles, uh, um, data around research papers, applying semantic meaning to that and structuring that data. And NLU obviously being a subset of NLP where you're focusing on machine reading comprehension. NLG is kind of partnered for that but on the other side in that you're taking that structured data and then you're trying to turn that into actually understandable, digestible, written language or spoken language that can drive meaning off that data. So as where NLP takes a ton of unstructured data and tries to structure it, NLG comes in with these large amounts of data sets we have, tries to identify insights, and then deliver them in a way people can quickly consume, which is the written word. So as Tim O'Reilly said before, the economy is built on stories. Why, why focus on natural language generation? We've got a lot of great visualization platforms, dashboarding platforms, BI platforms. We spend a lot of time collecting data. Why are we focused on turning that into unstructured data and communicating in text? And the reason we think that you do that is because people connect with words. They connect with language. People don't inherently understand data. That's why when you create a, uh, a dashboard, you create software, or you pull a report that's supposed to make meaning out of data for somebody, most of the times as, as data professionals, well, a lot of the time, you spend time sitting down writing a report about that dashboard you made. Or you spend time getting called to an executive's office to, to walk them through um, that dashboard and what it means for them. And it's not that people are, are lazy. Um, a lot of times they're on the road, they're intimidated by it, um, they, can't, uh, they can't access it where they are. Um, and so I think the other benefit to NLG is that there's a, uh, a data density to words. So if I have a pattern or trend that I want to expound or deliver to you, if I'm using dashboards or graphs or charts, I might have to do four, five, six graphs to capture that pattern or that trend pro properly. Whereas with narrative, all I have to do is say, you're having a strong quarter and here's why. Or this was not a good quarter for you and this is why and these are things you need to do about it. All I have to do is say it. And for the user, all they have to do is read. And so there's a couple approaches to NLG today. And I'll go through both of them and, uh, and talk a little bit about how they're working in the field, uh, drawbacks, and how they're constructed. And the two are around kind of neural networks and more of a, a rules-based approach uh, to creating those narratives. And NLG as a space is actually pretty interesting because the black box um, you know, machine learning approaches that are progressing really well in things like uh, image recognition and translation um, have, have not worked as well so far as the rules-based approach um, that's actually out there in the field and, and producing um, at, at a very large scale. So the machine learning approach, and we'll get into this a little bit, but I think it works re really well in specific cases like this where you're captioning a image uh, to talk a little bit about what's there, right? But you, you have a very simple um, a simple sentence, you know, and, and you're not trying to deliver, um, you know, deep insights with compelling, uh, coherent language. You're just describing what's in there. So the, the main issue on the, um, on the neural network side is that there's no singular rule set out there right now that can properly describe language that we can learn from and use to uh, uh, build upon. The problem with language in general and, and written content as well is that it, it's full of nuance, it's full of context, especially when you're trying to produce it. No two people do it exactly the same way. It's impossible um, at, at this given point in time so far to translate into code. So the, the approach that, that has actually been out there in producing more content in the field and that you're probably running into most often is a rules-based expert system. Um, that's partially what we do at Automated Insights. Our platform is called Wordsmith, and I'll go into that a little bit. But the idea on the rules-based side is that humans provide the context on the industry or the domain with which you're going to communicate on. That expertise is turned into rules. 
that are put into the system, and then you can generate an infinite number of variable narratives each time new data arises. So let's talk a little bit about both approaches. We'll expand upon the, uh, the image captioning first. So this is a good example of learning-driven or deep learning-driven NLG. This is from uh, Google's project around automatically captioning um, images. And this is an interesting example mainly because the, the, the whole ability to capture what's in that image um, and understand what that is, is is very powerful. On the NLG side, it's, it's pretty simplistic. Right now it's limited to object is beside another object. Um, and that works well in this context, but if you want to dig down and explain what's really going on in the picture, why the picture is important, provide additional um, context around that image, it becomes a lot harder. Because the hard thing with deep learning models is to identify the information there and then construct uh, interesting sentences around it. So you not only have to talk about what you see, but you have to talk about it in context. And the idea of actually um, you know, speaking intelligently or writing intelligently about something um, is a difficult thing to do because um, there's not great training corpuses in general for writing, and there's, there's none on a case-by-case, industry-by-industry uh, industry, um, set yet. So another example, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, of, of AI. This one's written by a neural network uh, around J.K. Rowling's novels, uh, Harry Potter. Um, it's pretty impressive that you can you know, write content with no human interaction at all, but as you can see, Voldemort smiled, his throat loudly. What did it work? Not to give them a perfect old, a lot of magic eye. It's pretty unintelligible, right? Um, so JK Rowling, it's not. But um, the problem here is that when you write something, you're trying to communicate a very specific meaning. And the writing itself carries a tremendous amount of context with it. And without it, becomes quickly detached from the reader um, and you lose them. So uh, we can't teach a machine to understand context yet. And without human assistance, we've had trouble building a set of rules that globally apply to writing. Another example here on the AI side is this is the Mirai. I don't know if you've, you've heard of this, but it's Toyota's new car of the future. I think it gets like 300, 400 miles per gallon. It's fuel cell based, and it uh, emits only water vapor. So it's pretty cool. They partnered with Satachi LA uh, and Watson to train Watson for, I think it was uh, about three months, with a goal of writing real-time ads and having AI-powered ads. Um, and these are some of the examples they came up with. Um, yes, it drives like a planet. It's kind of interesting. I don't really know what that means. I think that. Uh, it actually, I'm not sure it conjures up the, the driving ability or the, the speed or handling of a car. It sounds more like a London bus. But um, I think that you know, what you can see here is that they've put together real sentences that mean things. But the problem is it, it has no understanding, really, of the subject that it's trying to communicate. Um, it doesn't know how, what a car is, really, or how to sell it. It's essentially predicting the next word or group of words based on articles that it's seen before. Um, and so what happened with this project is they essentially just kept generating new ads and trying to train it and train it and kind of handpick the ones they liked. But even at the same time, they ended up having copywriters edit each one. So they weren't really AI-driven when they came out. Makes the claim of AI-driven ads a little dubious at, at, at best. Um, but it, but it is interesting in that you know, it, it's kind of a start to taking that content and producing something of value. I think the, uh, it's not yet meaningful in a commercial sense. So let's talk a little bit about um, Wordsmith, our platform, and a little bit about the rules-based approach and how that works and how it's working um, in the field. So Wordsmith is a SaaS-based technology platform. Basically, we leverage data. And that data can come from an API. It can come, like in this case, it's in a CSV. It could be Excel. It could come from multiple sources. We take that data, and we produce human-sounding content on the other side with all the tone, variability, and personality 
of a human writer. And we'll go into a lot of cases about um, how that's produced and uh, different industries that it's working in. But the idea, if you think about it, is to take a, a data scientist, a copywriter, uh, a customer service rep, and to think about how do they sit down, look at a data set, and then write a story for someone that they're trying to communicate with. So whether it's a, uh, a customer they're trying to explain the data to, whether it's a fellow employee that they're trying to help understand a dashboard, how do they go about structuring that story and writing it? And so we take the, the expertise um, that those people have, um, codify that into, into rules, and then essentially produce stories at scale. And so it's not to say we don't incorporate machine learning. We do. Um, we just do it with rules as opposed to uh, without any. So a, little, a few examples of natural language generation on the rules-based side uh, in the wild. Um, I don't know if any of you play Call of Duty with Activision, uh, but one thing that we're doing with them is we are taking data on every session that players have as they go out and they play the game. We're compiling that. We're comparing them versus other players like them, versus themselves over time, versus the aggregate of all the players, and we are writing a story for every single user on a weekly basis, but it can be done in real time too. And essentially, the cool thing about that is each one of those stories, and it's millions per week, is written for one person and one person alone. So it's got tone. We actually make fun of the users. We give them advice. Um, you know, it, it, it sounds like it's coming from a, a real human. And, and the value there is instead of writing one story and hoping it's relevant to every single Call of Duty player, we're writing a story that's about you. You're taking time playing the game. We've, they're getting the data around your gameplay, and they're delivering you insights about yourself that you couldn't have known before. Another example in that same area is with Yahoo. Um, this is more of an American sports example, but with, with fantasy sports, they have tens of millions of people that play uh, fantasy football, American football, on a weekly basis. And so what we do with them is we actually write a story for every single matchup every week. It's like a reporter was covering that matchup. And again, we make fun of them, we grade them. But I think the key here is that each one of these projects took less time to uh, develop than the three months that Satachi LA spent with Watson training it. And the content that's coming out is far more complex. The Yahoo one actually is around 1,000 words every week with visualizations. And it, but more importantly, it's a lot more predictable and reliable, especially when you're doing it at a scale of, of millions and millions. And I think the important thing for um, AI-driven NLG in the future is you not only have to tell an interesting story in a point in time, you have to tell it over time. So like I could tell millions of different stories that are relevant person to person for Yahoo, but it's harder for that individual person to continue to evolve the story over time and tell them a relevant story each week and allow that data to drive a, a, a better engagement with them um, each week. The other space where NLG is uh, being used extensively is in business intelligence. This happens to be with one of our partners with TIBCO. The idea being that NLG serves as a very powerful presentation layer on, on big data. So if you're in a dashboard, it kind of goes back to that example I had earlier. If you've got a dashboard, the, the value behind that dashboard is being able to apply context to all the visualizations within it and to explain how they're interacting against each other. And you can do that if you're in person, if you're there. But most of uh, the people we work with, you have these uh, very active BI teams, very smart people, spending time handwriting reports. So what NLG gives them the ability to do is to codify their expertise into a rules-based system that then will produce real-time narratives around any dashboard they have. And what's better, if you've got multiple layers of the organization looking at the same dashboard, so maybe you have salespeople that are looking at it, you have sales managers, you have executives, you have on up the chain, you can essentially tell each one of them a different story about what's relevant for them around the data um, every, for each person as they, as they log in. So, um, 
you know, the, the problem with dashboards is just that they require interpretation. Um, and so NLG can help alleviate that a little bit in providing some context. So uh, a little bit about the size and scale of NLG today. We're still talking about 2017 and, and where it's going. Um, Wordsmith itself produced about a billion and a half narratives last year. We've been at that scale uh, around the last couple of years. Hopefully, we'll get around two billion this year. Um, like I said, it's a SaaS-based platform, so a lot of our customers are creating the content themselves. We're currently active in, uh, I think, over 20 languages. That includes Mandarin, Japanese, Korean, English, German, um, even emojis. I had somebody writing a whole story in emojis, which I thought was, I don't know. I don't know if that counts as a language. I'll count it. Um, but it's, it's in over 50 industries, so everything from BI and sports, which we've talked about, to Internet of Things, to SEO, to finance, to healthcare, basically anything with a structured data set. And so a little bit more on the, on the rules-based kind of approach. You know, the problem with rules-based systems as they've evolved up until now is that they get, the, uh, they get the hammer that they're mail merge. I think those break down pretty quickly, especially when you're in a scale of millions. Um, the important thing is that the language modeling needs to be complex um, and many layers deep. Um, and then that gives you the chance to develop a rule set to then train the system. So with our SaaS platform, our clients are producing uh, millions of stories every week, sometimes millions of stories an hour. And so that is developing a corpus for us on a domain-specific basis in those 50 industries uh, to develop training sets um, that can help them evolve their writing and how we write um, in the future. So that's how a rules-based system can both capture interesting information and produce a domain-specific and relevant, useful narrative uh, that actually reads like somebody wrote about it um, today. And so I talked a little bit about the scale. Um, and this is just Wordsmith. There's, there's other NLG going on. So it's, it's, it's become really huge. Um, but you know, where we're focused, like in media, for example, uh, the idea is the typical model is you write that one story and you're hoping that 10 million people read it. Um, to the extent you can flip that and write 10 million stories and have each be relevant to an audience of one, that's where it becomes powerful. Um, and so a little bit about an actual um, kind of case study about how this is working um, in the field. We work with the Associated Press. And to give you an example of what they were doing, um, they had, I don't know exactly how many investigative journalists, but they were writing earnings summaries for public companies. So when Apple or Amazon or Google filed their earnings, they would have a reporter rush to that filing, read through it, look at background data on historical performance, and write a story as fast as they possibly could, because they needed to get those stories to the wire as quick as they could. The problem with that is you've got journalists who are not data experts um, looking through data and doing data analysis. You have them writing the same type of story over and over again. And you have constraints in that they can over, only cover so many. So with the AP, I think they were covering 200 or 300 them, of them per quarter by hand. Um, and it was taking a ton of time. And so what we did for them is actually automate that, that expertise that those journalists had. And now we're producing four or 5,000, and, and we can produce more a quarter. Um, so taking them from that hundreds to thousands, and right when the earnings comes out for, for a company, it goes directly to the wire. It's published instantaneously. The error rate's actually gone down, both grammatically um, and data-wise. And as you can see, TransCanada um, is, a, is a good-sized company, but it would never have been covered before. This is a story that just would not have existed, because uh, the AP could not afford to have that many humans writing that content financially. But they've got syndicate partners around the world that are interested in news on the local public company. But they're not covering it. So NLG gives them the ability to essentially publish that story, have it sound exactly like they want their reporters to sound, 
um, and to be published um, you know, within seconds after the filing. So I talked a little bit about the errors dropping um, and, and the coverage including. I think they were able to take their investigative journalists they had writing those stories and focus them on other uniquely human articles. Um, and, and to provide, uh, you know, they're now providing you know, thousands of more stories to their syndicate partners on kind of public companies that those, those syndicate partners wanted coverage of. So as soon as that went out, those reporters started writing stories about AI taking their jobs, which is um, usually the thrust of, of stories about AI. But the real trend line is actually here. Um, where we're focused is kind of where Tim O'Reilly says, you know, you, want to, you don't want to replace humans, you want to augment them. And what we found is that human plus machine um, is a lot more effective to improve that content over time. So in the AP example, they actually can go in and edit any story they want. The stories go directly to the wire. Um, but then, you know, if there's context that a reporter wants to add because they follow that company and they know it really well, they can go in and edit that story. So a good example is like with Disney. Um, we know that it's their best year in the last decade, and we're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about um, how great the year was. What we don't know is that two Star Wars movies came out in the same year. Like, you know, we, it's not in the data set that we get. So the human, and in this case, I think it did happen, was able to go in and add things like the forces with Disney, you know, and add context and quotes to that um, that aren't in the data-driven part of the story um, and enrich that story and allow the software to do what it's good at, which is the how and the what, and allow the humans to do, add the context that they're good at and the why. So the other area that's, that's similar there is in sports, uh, the AP was, they, they can afford to send a journalist to every single Major League Baseball game in the US and write stories about those games. But there's a whole minor league system that's feeding uh, MLB that their syndicate partners are interested in and there's fans of those minor league teams. So we actually publish around 10,000 stories a year on every single minor league baseball game um, in the US. Um, and again, that's content that their syndicate partners are interested in, but there was no way that content would have existed um, without something like WordSmith. So um, a little bit to end on this, in late 2016, Stanford did a study um, in partnership with the University of Washington where they looked at about 22 to 2,500 of the companies that had been uh, reported on by natural language generation by WordSmith. And they did a study of trading volume for those companies and the liquidity of those companies. And as you can see, it rose quite a bit because people were actually starting to hear about it. And I think this is a, a really strong statement to People actually do want this content. It just wouldn't have existed without NLG. Uh, we're still waiting on the thank you notes for the, the liquidity stuff, but I don't think we'll get it. But um, I think to wrap everything back together um, on kind of AI versus rules driven and how they interact and where NLG is headed, generalizable NLG as, as you know, I think we all want it to be is very hard. Uh, writing is a creative process. There's, there's infinite possibilities associated with it. We all write in different ways. Um, you know, you need to be able to understand the topic and, and have expertise in the topic, but you also have to be able to communicate that in an effective way that people want to read and people want to read over time. Um, and it's, it's hard to train a system to do that when there's not training sets available for it. So you can utilize that rules-based approach to build those training sets. Um, as far as NLG in 2017 um, and where it is today, you know, even after 10 years of working with this, I think it's, it's come a long way. Uh, we started in 2007. Um, you know, we launched our SaaS-based platform. We were doing everything in-house up until 2016. Um, and, and the stuff that people are actually creating, like early in the beta of our, our new SaaS platform, we had a user trying to automate actual music, not like lyrics, but actual music using words to, to drive the key. So I think we're at the very early stages of the possibilities for natural language generation. Right now, 
it's, it's kind of doing a couple things. It's helping scale existing articles like in the AP sense. It's helping personalize content to you know, each individual employee like in the BI case or uh, to a customer like in the, the Activision case. Um, and it's primarily focused in data intensive industries. Um, but I think as we get more and more structured data and ways to collect that data, we're going to be able to communicate more qualitatively and in non-traditional data-driven fields like financial services, BI, e-commerce, and real estate and those types of things. So a little more about like, what, and what's happening with NLG today. So we hear a lot about AI chatbots. Uh, we talked about uh, you know, Microsoft's Tay and those types of things. I think where NLG can come in is to help personalize content to provide some uh, context so you actually feel like you're talking to a person. This one, we actually, uh, AccuWeather has a publicly uh, available API, so we quickly synced up with it in the Wordsmith API and started producing uh, a chatbot here, which I, I can make available. But the idea is that when you apply tone like, you know, should I wear, what should I wear today? Uh, and the AccuWeather real field temperature is 48 degrees, so unless you're particularly hardy, you need to wear a jacket. I guess I shouldn't have had it in Fahrenheit. Um, but eight degrees Celsius, somewhere in there. Um, but essentially, um, you know, applying a more conversational tone makes that interaction uh, a lot more productive. Um, another case is in voice being a communication layer or the next kind of interface as you hear more and more about um, from, yeah, I'm going to try a video that's never good, but I'm going to try it. Um, but essentially, like with the growth of uh, voice assistants like Alexa, uh, you know, with Google Home, Siri, um, and those driving conversations, um, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for NLG to become a critical component of that because everything so far has been focused on what you say to, the, to Google Home, to Alexa, to Siri. I think we've all experienced there's not much that's been put into what she says back or what it says back to you, right, and how engaging that is. Um, and so what I'll show you here is we actually um, participated in the Tableau hackathon. We won that, their hackathon this year. And our project that I'll show you a portion of was to take an Alexa, and this was around US election data because their conference was held on election night. Um, but what we're doing here, just to give you a little background, is we are uh, taking the structured question through Alexa so we get what they ask about the data set. We then use that to drive a change in the actual dashboard. And then using the APIs with, with uh, Tableau, we're grabbing all the data behind that dashboard to create a real-time story to feed back to Alexa to actually respond with. So it's a dynamic narrative back. Let me see where my... All right, cross your fingers. Automated Insights yeah. Wordsmith platform turns data into human sounding analysis. For our hackathon entry, we focused on combining the Git data API. All right, let's go. Let's... Ask Wordsmith elections to show me the battleground states. Donald J. Trump leads the vote count in six out of the 11 battleground states and has won Florida and Wisconsin. He is actually behind 39 to 52 in electoral college votes from the battlegrounds that have been called. The race is also close in three okay. non-battleground states. So that keeps going. But the idea being that you can grab full context behind that dashboard, talk about the, the numbers behind it, and even bring up additional things like uh, you know, battleground states that, that, that weren't expected. And this is another thing that in BI we're doing more and more of that people who are, uh, you know, have visual or uh, other impairments that make it hard to interpret a dashboard can control that uh, through a voice device but also interact with it uh, so that they get uh, more detailed um, context coming back through it as a script. Right, so we're looking at that dashboard. So it kind of goes back to the, the, the BI um, use case I mentioned earlier. You are, uh, you are building the rule set around that dashboard to be able to tell a story about it. And so it's, that was one graph, so it's kind of easy. But if you have five or six graphs, the, the magic of a dashboard is how they interact together, how one thing is driving a result in another, 
and related to another. And so the problem is once you hand those off, if you're not there to walk people through it, that's where dashboards end up failing, right? Or if there's a pattern that almost never happens, like it happens once every 30 years, but it's critical, a lot of times with a dashboard, you miss that, right? Because when it pops up, you just didn't see it. Whereas with narrative, you can essentially make the narrative all about that. Okay, running low on time. So actually, close to the end here. So we talked a little bit about NLG uh, as it exists today. When we were founded in 2007, we actually started on sports data, and we were producing a couple hundred insights around how basketball players were doing. And to see that kind of develop into billions of stories a year, I think, has been impressive. I wouldn't have thought it would go that far in, in the 10 years we've been working on it. Um, you know, over the next 10 years, I think it continues to expand in certain areas like we've talked about, like BI and media and finance and, and, and e-commerce. Um, but I think what's exciting is that uh, there's untold use cases that are going to invariably just pop up. Um, we actually at, at AI have quarterly hackathons. And so at the presentation day, it's cool because you've got you know, uh, a, a ton of people sitting down on a SaaS platform building rules-based structures around uh, natural language stories they want to tell. And we see interesting things coming out of just that. So things like I think in the last one, we had a dynamic storybook uh, for, for this employee's children. We had uh, someone generating live code uh, to actually create a mobile app around hotels. Uh, we had automated text summarization. So there's a lot of things that you can do. I think on the technical side, in 10 years, we won't truly have generalized NLG, as I've described it, as you've seen the use cases for. Um, that's you know, where you put data in, and then magic happens. And it, without any context on the data, it's intelligently talking about it. Um, but I think improvements in NLP and NLU uh, will help us better understand not only uh, data sets that are out there, uh, but also how people are writing with NLG so that we can build training sets to uh, learn how they're writing and then improve that writing. Um, so that in certain verticals, verticalized NLG will become much more like magic. Because you'll have a trained kind of data sets, you'll know in general what you're talking about, and you'll be able to create an accurate set of rules that when you drop that data in there, uh, you can start talking about it um, intelligently. I still think that humans are going to be needed, uh, but needed more as editors um, as opposed to, to writers. Uh, you know, you'll want to make sure that you, you don't describe a car as driving like a planet. Um, but I think, I think you know, from where we've been in 2007 to where we are today, there's a lot of possibilities. I think that, um, let's see if I'm able to pull this up. No. Um, you know, We'll have more and more structured data, and you know, over a trillion pieces of, of content per year is probably um, inherently possible as you personalize that, that down around real-time data, point-of-sale data, personalizing that data to an individual user. And that everything, every story that could be data-driven um, most likely will have a data-driven story about it or a version of it. Um, and so I think I'm about at time. Is it, am I out of time? Two minutes if there's a question or so. I think that's it. Yeah. Well, I think with the rules-based system, you, um, uh, the question was, what if it's inconsistent as a whole because you can't th think through all the possible permutations, right? Um, with the rules-based system, you get a much better um, chance at, at st stopping that. So if it's outside of parameters, actually not publishing or publishing around that you need more um, data, I think it quickly becomes uh, evident what you're missing. And so that's part of the reason why interacting with human experts in the space and data experts on the space is so important. Because what you want to know is that, like, is A being greater than B by C percent, is that interesting? If, you know, X is game changing if it shows up, but it probably never will. 
you know, to actually build that kind of logic into those rules so that when they do occur, you're, you're capturing that. Because those are the things that are easy to miss and the outliers. Uh, we spend a lot of time uh, with our clients and our clients that create it in looking at not only the ones that happen all the time, like the instances where you're seeing that data come out in a similar way so you can write about it in a variable nature um, and, and keep it interesting, but also the ones where um, they happen like almost never and to make sure you're capturing those outliers as well and talking about them in an intelligent way. And I think I am out of time now. But I'll be around if anybody has questions. Thank you very much.